Um, so I'm also the first speaker, um, and what I'm going to do is tell you um, about three of the research projects we've been engaged in um, over the last uh, few years. Um, so first of all, just to say a bit about Warwick Crop Centre, um, those of you who are very old like me uh, may remember the National Vegetable Research Station at Wellsbourne. Um, so we're what was the National Vegetable um, Research Station. Um, we basically work on, on crops, all aspects of crop production, and our focus is vegetable crops. Um, so we have the, the expertise that you would expect, um, and we also host the UK Vegetable Gene Bank, and, and those of you who were in here yesterday afternoon will have heard my colleague Charlotte um, talking about the, the carrot collection in the Gene Bank. Um, and because we're a university, apart from doing research, we also do teaching and training. So just to the background of, of carrot in the UK, um, so carrot and other apiaceous crops are grown on about 11,000 hectares in the UK, and we're virtually self-sufficient in, in carrots. Um, they're grown throughout the country, so from Scotland in the north right down to the south of the country. They're sown between January and June, and they're harvested almost 12 months of the year, so we don't put them in cold stores during the winter. Um, and during the winter, the crop stays in the ground and it's protected from frost with straw and plastic. Um, so our main pests and pathogens are carrot fly, um, willow carrot aphid, um, so soil-borne fungi, sclerotinia, pythium, obviously alternaria. Um, but today I'm going to focus on those four species. Um, and all of them obviously threaten crop quality, um, and effective control can be difficult in certain circumstances for various reasons. So in terms of control of carrot fly, then since the mid-1990s, the only group of insecticides that our growers have had are pyrethroid insecticides. Um, and although there's no evidence of insecticide resistance in this species, um, it's dangerous to rely on just one group of insecticides. Um, so our recent research has focused on identifying alternative insecticides, if, if they're available, and also non-insecticidal methods of control, so, so cultural methods of, of control, um, and also at applying them at appropriate timings. And the insecticide Corrigan, Rhinaxipir, produced by uh, DuPont, has recently become available to UK carrot growers. Um, so we undertook a piece of work for them on this insecticide. So this was a field trial um, last year, and basically we compared either one spray or two sprays of Corrigan with um, a full program of pyrethroid insecticides. So growers uh, tend to apply a number of, of pyrethroid insecticide treatments in, in succession. And this is for control of, of the second generation of carrot fly, which usually emerges in, in July um, to, to August. Um, and what they aim to do with pyrethroids is target the first spray at the predicted time when the adult flies will emerge because pyrethroid sprays kill adult, adult flies. So what we did in our trial was look at different timings using time zero as the predicted time when the flies would emerge. And we do this using a, a temperature-based um, forecast. Unfortunately, in 2013, carrot fly didn't quite behave as it usually does. Um, so we always get a, a big first generation peak that you can see on the left hand side of the graph. And then usually we also get a big second generation peak as well in July or August. Um, but it was very hot at that time. And I think a large number of the flies actually estivated. So they stayed dormant in the soil. So we got a much more um, delayed emergence. Nevertheless, we still got differences um, between our treatments. And what our trial showed was that that one spray of Corrigan um, applied at time zero uh, wasn't enough. 
um, that growers needed um, to apply two sprays to get comparable control with the, the full program of, of pyrethroids. So basically that is good news because there is another active ingredient they can use as part of their control program. Now to move on to um, the willow carrot aphid. Um, again, the emphasis of our research is about identifying at effective active ingredients, which might be uh, chemical insecticides or might be biopesticides, and then treatment timings um, that minimize the risk of virus transmission, and that's particularly by parsnip yellow fleck virus. Um, so this aphid overwinters as eggs on, on salix species. Um, the eggs hatch, and then it completes a number of generations, and then winged forms are, are produced, um, and they fly to secondary host crops, so to carrot crops, over a period of about five to six weeks. So what we're trying to do is identify when this, this flight starts. So we're very fortunate in the UK to have a network of, of suction traps, um, which basically suck in flying insects, particularly aphids, and this is run by the Rothamsted Insect Survey. And this work was done by one of our master's students for his summer project, um, and he used two subsets of this data. So he used a 31-year um, a run from Rothamsted itself, and then he also used a set of data from, from nine locations from the north to the south of the country um, from 1981 to 1988. And then because these aphids, they fly to the carrots in the spring and they fly back to the willow in the autumn, you have to actually decide at what date you're going to do your cut-off between those two migrations. So he looked at all the data and decided that the 17th of August was a, a sensible date to cut off the, the two periods. And then what he was looking at was using temperature data um, to actually uh, produce some sort of prediction of when this flight would occur. Um, so he had... Um, air temperatures from a number of weather stations. So what he did first was look at the, the captures in this first peak and work out the dates for each year, for each set of data, when the first aphid, when 10% of the total aphids and when 50% of the total aphids were, were captured in, in dates. Um, and then he also... Um, looked at measures of, of spring and summer temperature to those dates using either mean temperatures or accumulated day degrees. And usually with day degrees, you have some idea of what the, the low temperature threshold for insect development is. But for this species, this isn't really known. Um, so he looked at a range of base temperatures and also a range of start dates um, from which to accumulate day degrees. Um, and just to sort of look at the basic data from Rothamsted, though, then over that 31-year period, the mean date of capture was the 30th of May. This is 10% capture. The earliest was the 16th of May, and the latest was the 21st of June. So that's 36 days difference in the date when 10% of aphids were, were flying. So that's a big difference. So, first of all, he looked at the relationship between the dates of capture in each year and mean temperature, different um, start dates, different periods for mean temperature. And this, for example, is the relationship between the mean temperature between January and April and the date of 10% capture. Um, you can see there's a lot of scatter, which is partly to do with the random nature of trapping aphids in suction traps, um, but in all cases, um, there was a negative correlation between mean temperature and the dates of capture. So basically saying that in a warmer year, the aphids will be captured earlier, which is, which is obvious, but you're trying to put some sort of mathematical relationship to it. Um, then he also looked at day degree sums for different thresholds, um, different start dates, and for example... Um, he showed that for a base temperature of 4 degrees C, which is probably a pretty good estimate, um, the day degrees accumulated from the 1st of January to the date of 10% capture were 490. 
This was a relatively constant sum, whether aphids were captured early or captured late. Um, and he used, he did that based on the first data set, and then he validated it, tested it on the second data set, and he found that the mean absolute difference between the prediction and what actually happened um, was 7.2 days. So that's probably quite a reasonable estimate um, to be starting with. Uh, and at least, if you think of the whole spread being 36 days, possibly, then you're homing in on the, on the period. So finally, I want to talk a bit about some work um, that um, two colleagues are doing. So this is, is John Clarkson um, and his PhD student, Rachel Warmington. And they're looking at the use of biofumigation to control soil-borne diseases of, of carrot, focusing on sclerotinia um, and pythium, so, so um, the cause of, of cavity spot. Um, and basically, again, it's a, it's a problem with, with crop quality. Um, and basically, we're looking for alternative methods of, of control. So the, the species of plant that he's using, or they're using for biofumigants, are mustards. Um, and basically, the, the idea behind it is that, that before you grow your carrot crop, um, you grow a crop of one of these, these mustards. Um, their growth may actually stimulate beneficial microorganisms um, that will help to control um, your pathogens, or the incorporation may as well. And probably the, the key effect is that when the biofumigant is, is broken down and incorporated into the soil, um, the, the glucosinolates in the mustards are converted to isothiocyanates, um, which are toxic to the pathogenic fungi. Um, so the basic question was, can biofumigation control sclerotinia and cavity spot? So just a couple of experiments here. Um, first of all, um, Rachel did a, a lab test um, where basically she buried um, sclerotia of sclerotinia in little tubs in soil. She had dried biofumigants, incorporated them, and she recorded germination. Um, and you can see the untreated control on the right-hand side of the, the graph. And you can see that all of the treatments um, reduced uh, germination of the, the sclerotia. Um, a second trial, again, this, this was targeted at cavity spot, uh, and this was a field trial, um, and she looked at two lines of, of mustard, and again, a control treatment on the, the right-hand side, and again, um, there was good suppression of, of cavity spot. Um, but the results to them suggested that the, the mustards reduce cavity spot, but not necessarily the growth of, of pythium. So they may actually be stimulating beneficial microorganisms that, that colonize the, the soil after the, the biofumigation. So in summary, um, they've shown, and, and Rachel has done um, considerable great, greater amount of work since then, that biofumigant crops delay and, and suppress germination of, of sclerotinia in box tests. Um, then now, well, in fact, she has now undertaken further work to evaluate the effect in the field. Um, and an initial field experiment suggested that brown mustard can also suppress cavity spot in the field. And I guess the, the clever thing is actually matching your biofumigant um, to the, the thing that you actually want to, want to control um, and optimizing your, your technique so that you get the, the best effect. Um, and in terms of insecticides, then Corrigan um, provides an effective alternative to pyrethroid insecticides for control of carrot fly. Um, it's certainly feasible to forecast the start of the migration of, of willow carrot aphid using air temperature data. And 
What we particularly like to work on is integrated control strategies, um, and all three of these approaches show promise as components of, of integrated pest and disease management programs. So just to talk about the funding, so the work on carrot fly was funded by the, the UK Horticultural Development Company, um, and that is a grower-funded organisation. Um, they fund applied R&D. Uh, as I've already mentioned, the work on the aphid was undertaken as an MSc project by, by Dan Wilson. Um, we were provided with the... the the trapping data and the weather data um, by other organisations for which we're very grateful. And Rachel's PhD is also funded by the, the Horticultural Development Company. So thank you for listening. Thank you very much for a very impressive uh, speech. But the questions is uh, the questions of, uh, from, the, from the breeding point of view. Uh, do you have the database for all uh, diseases of migration of the pests in our country? And could you provide some information for the, for the breeders and the other com companies who work with the carrot and other crops? Have you the database and you can react very rapidly and provide information about the last diseases, about the, how can you update your information about uh, diseases. So I think you're asking about whether we've got a database of, of information. Yes, yes. Um, we don't have a we don't have a database as such, but but the organisation that I just mentioned, the Horticultural Development Company, um, they each of the 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 crop groups. So there's a, a group for carrots and parsnips, a group for brassicas. Um, they have a list of research priorities. Um, that they, they publish on their website so anybody can read them. Um, so they identify, I guess, both in terms of severity and in terms of commercial importance, what, what the key targets are in the UK. That's good, thank you. <laughs> One more and then we'll move on. Do you have to... Um incorporate the mustard or could it be used as a cover crop and sow into it have you tried have you um, would I've, that not work my understanding obviously it's not not my my area my understanding is that it has to be incorporated to get the best effect because you have to sort of seal it in for the gas because it's basically a gas um to to work okay yeah. thank you